This video will cover monopolistic competition. We'll discuss the characteristics of monopolistic competition, analyze the output decisions to figure out quantity and at that quantity determine profitability. We'll discuss the welfare effects of monopolistic competition. We'll compare and contrast it against perfect competition. And in the end, we'll talk a little bit about product differentiation and just a little bit about advertising. And then we'll conclude the video. Recall that when, with monopolistic competition, there are differentiated goods. Either differentiated in fact, where there truly are differences, or just perception. And so that's where the advertising part comes in later on in the video that we cover briefly, is that advertising can change perceptions even if the product themselves are the same. So we have differentiated goods, and that kind of starts moving us towards monopoly because there, we're not looking at a commodity like we did with perfect competition. We're looking at goods that are slightly different, maybe more than slightly different. And when, with monopolistic competition, we'll have many sellers. Well, that sounds a lot like perfect competition. We'll have many buyers, although, you know, the buyers are in the background in this, in this story. It's the, the, the point is there's many sellers, and that's, that's the part that looks like perfect competition. So as I say here, there is a blend of perfect competition and a monopoly. And so what happens is these producers, firms, they're trying to, to differentiate their product so that they have some pricing power, what we call market power or pricing power. They have some ability to set prices, but there are close substitutes nearby. When they have the ability to set prices, they're facing downward sloping demand curves. So if you recall, with perfect competition, the demand curve was perfectly flat for a particular firm in perfect competition. But with monopolistic competition, each firm faces a downward sloping demand curve. That's market power. That's what that's implying. Now, examples of monopolistic competition abound. It's everywhere, which is why I like this form of market structure. It explains a lot. And so examples are local restaurants. Local restaurants stride on having the best recipes, the nice atmosphere, a good location, and a good feeling and good time. But there are close substitutes nearby. Other examples would be Starbucks, a retail bakery would be another thing, even universities. So here we have a monopolistically competitive firm, and it's always important when you look at these graphs to make sure you, you know whether or not you're looking at a graph to a particular firm or to an industry. Here it's a firm. It's a monopolistically competitive firm in the short run. And the reason we're in the short run here and showing this is because this firm is producing profits. Now let's see. The decision for quantity output is where marginal cost equals marginal revenue like we've been showing. So we'll play, put QMC. Now we're going to come up, and at this particular quantity, the price will be here. This will be the price that the monopolistically competitive firm will charge. This is its average costs, and so therefore, this is profits. That's profits accruing to this monopolistically competitive firm in the short run. And that's important to recognize this is a short run because there is a degree of competition in this market. And this firm faces a degree of competition. When other firms see these profits, they want to steal them. They want to compete them away. And so what's going to happen is this demand curve is going to shrink for this firm. The demand curve for this firm because there's going to be new companies entering into the market. And this demand curve will start to shrink along with the marginal cost curve. They'll both come down. They'll come down to a point where there will be no profits. And this demand curve will come down. And I'm not going to show, yeah, I shouldn't show it right now because it's just going to be too messy. But this whole demand curve will shift down until it becomes tangent to the average total cost curve. And so I'm not going to show it now. I'll show it to you shortly when I get to the long run. So the point is, in the short run, firms can have profits, but they're going to be stolen uh, pretty quickly. 
and we'll end up in a long run equilibrium. Now, let's show what happens when there is a loss. So here it is, again, it's a firm, monopolistic firm, and the optimal output is right here. QMC, where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. We're gonna come up and come over, and this will be the price for the monopolistically competitive firm. Okay. Now, ooh, look what happens. The average total cost curve is up here, so this firm is making a loss of this amount. And what's gonna happen is, firms, that are, there's gonna be other firms in the industry that are similar to this. And they're going to, they're, they're, some of them are going to be exiting the industry. When they exit, exit the industry, if this particular firm stays in the, in the business and other firms exit, this demand curve will shift up. The demand curve faced by this particular business will, will shift up. It'll shift up till it's tangent to the average total cost curve. And like I said a minute ago, I'll show you that in a second. So there we have it. In the short run, you can have profits or losses, but those profits and losses either cause entry or exit to the market. And in the long run, we're going to have a situation where there are no profits. Just like with perfectly competitive markets, there is no profits and there's differentiation. So there's a form of monopoly going on here. So let's look at the long run. Drew it out here. So in the long run, the demand curve is tangent to the average total cost curve. Your marginal revenue curve is here. You have output set at this point. You come up and you, let me write it down here, show you. Come up, you come over, and here's price, and this is quantity for a monopolistically competitive firm in the long run. And so what you have is, you first off, you have price equals average total cost. There's no profits at this point. That has the feeling of perfect competition, right? No profits in the long run. But remember that the profits, that there are profits, economic profits. There's profits that enough that firms want to stay in business. They're happy with it. And you might ask, well, you know, you could even ask this with perfect competition. Some people ask, well, why doesn't the firm just, you know, move into another industry where it can make a profit? It's not making any profit here. In perfect competition, it's not making any profit. Keep in mind that these costs technically include all opportunity costs. So they have no other options because if they had other options, they, could, they would move into those other options. So these, these cost curves reflect opportunity costs. Keep that in mind. So the point is in this right here, we have the price equals average total cost, just like perfect competition. Price is greater than marginal cost, as you can see. And then we have, we're below efficient scale. So efficient scale with a benchmark perfect competition, we have quantity must much less. And so there you have it. Now, what I want to do is look at the effects of, of welfare. Now, you know, should I, when we, do you want to look at, you know, you might ask yourself, do you want to look at deadweight loss associated with a monopolistically competitive firm? Do, should we impose that here? And the answer is no. There is a deadweight loss, but you want to look at it from the market level, the industry level, not the firm level. Okay, so when you look at these deadweight losses, and you're looking at uh, consumer and producer surplus, you need to realize that you should be looking at the industry level or market level. So here we have a monopolistically competitive industry in the long run. And I left out the average total cost curve because it just makes a mess of things. So here we have the marginal cost curve, demand, the marginal revenue curve. Now, with perfect competition, right, price would equal marginal cost, which would equal average total cost. We'd be right here producing at this point QPC. But as you can see, with monopolistic competition, quantity, as we just showed a little earlier, is less. And there is a difference between price and marginal cost. And so here we have consumer surplus, price to cost with 
monopolistic, sur monopolistic competitive firm. There's producer surplus, and the dead weight loss is this triangle right here. Right away, you got to ask yourself, hmm, dead weight loss. You know, kind of reminds you of a tax, uh, like the dead weight loss we had with a tax. And so you could try to look at this as negative because, you know, prices are higher than what you would have in a perfectly competitive market. Quantity is less. There's transactions not being, beneficial transactions not taking place. And that's what the dead weight loss represents. And so the so you would think first off, well, this can't be good, but there's there's two sides of the coin. There are certainly some negative aspects associated with that restricted output, this dead weight loss, but that can be viewed as the cost of product differentiation, the cost of variety, and that is valuable to consumers. Consumers demand variety, and so perfect competition doesn't give you variety, but monopolistically competitive firms will give you variety. They'll give you a variety up to a point, keeping in mind that there's always substitutes out there that are not far away. So they, they have monopolistic elements, but they're not total monopolies. So it's an interesting compare and contrast between monopolistic competitiveness and, and perfect competition. Now, one more thing before I wrap up this video. There's a long, deep debate as to whether or not advertising causes this dead weight loss that's going on here and the benefits of advertising and the costs of advertising. Is advertising worth it? You know, what's the marginal benefits and marginal costs to advertising? And is it driving this differentiation? Because it could be that it's just total perception and branding issues that's not necessarily around differences in quality. So I don't want to get into that. That's a long, deep argument. But nevertheless, it's there. I'll save that discussion for the business ethics professors and the marketing professors out there.